Hello, this is Mrs. Rylander, and it's been a while since I made a story, but to be totally honest with you, I ran out of books. All of my cool books are at school, and so I went um, and borrowed some books from some friends. So I have some more books to share with you. This is one of my favorite stories called Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. You might have seen the movie before, and if you haven't seen the movie before, after you read this, you should ask Mom and Dad about trying to find that movie, uh, maybe on Amazon Prime or on Netflix or something, and then you could talk and talk about things that are the same and things that are different about the book and the movie. Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. This is written by Judy Barrett, and it was illustrated by Ron Barrett. We were all sitting around the big kitchen table. It was Saturday morning, pancake morning. Mom was making orange juice. Henry and I were betting on how many pancakes we could eat. And Grandpa was flipping the pancakes. These illustrations are kind of cool. They're all black and white line drawings. Seconds later, a pancake flew through the air, headed toward the kitchen ceiling, and landed right on Henry. We all laughed, even Grandpa. All the other pancakes landed in the pan. We ate all of them, even the one that landed on Henry. That sounds like a fun breakfast. That night, Grandpa told us the best bedtime story ever. He said the flying pancake made him think of it. Across an ocean, over lots of huge bumpy mountains, across three hot deserts and one smaller ocean, there lay the tiny town of Chew and Swallow. Oops, the pages got stuck together. In most ways, it was like any other tiny town. It had a main street, stores, houses, trees, gardens, a schoolhouse, about 300 people, and some cats and dogs. But there were no food stores in the town of Chew and Swallow. They didn't need any. The only thing that was really different about Chew and Swallow was its weather. It came three times a day, at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Everything that everyone ate came from the sky. I'm already thinking about if it rained tacos, best day ever. It never rained rain, it never snowed snow, and it never blew just wind. It rained things like soup and juice. It snowed mashed potatoes and green peas, and sometimes the wind blew in storms of hamburgers. Seems like that might be kind of messy, but delicious. Every morning, people watched the weather report on TV to find out what they would eat that day. They would even hear a prediction for the next day's food. When the townspeople went outside, they carried their plates, cups, glasses, glasses, forks, spoons, knives, and napkins with them. That way, they would always be ready for any kind of weather. If there were leftovers, the people took them home and put them in their refrigerators in case they got hungry between meals. I like how he even has plates up in his closet. It looks like people are catching juice with umbrellas. By the time they woke up in the morning, breakfast was coming down. First there was a shower of orange juice. Then low clouds of sunny side up eggs moved in, followed by pieces of toast. Butter and jelly sprinkled down for the toast, and most of the time it rained milk afterward. Sunny side eggs are those kind like that one right there where you pay, put it in the pan and it cooks from the bottom up and so you still see the white part and the yellow part of the egg. The yellow part is called the yolk. For lunch one day, frankfurters and rolls blew in from the northwest at about five miles an hour. That's a fancy way of saying a hot dog. There were mustard clouds nearby. Then the wind shifted to the east and brought in baked beans. A drizzle of soda finished off the meal. That would be a sticky rain of soda. I hope it would be Diet Dr. Pepper soda. Or maybe you'd wish it to be orange soda. Or maybe you like just Sprite. 
For dinner one night, there were lamb chops, becoming heavy at times, with occasional ketchup. Periods of peas and baked potatoes were followed by gradual clearing, with the wonderful jello setting in the west. The sanitation department of Chew and Swallow had to remove the food that fell on the houses and sidewalks and lawns. The workers cleaned things up after every meal and fed all the cats and dogs. Then they emptied the leftovers into the ocean for the fish and turtles and whales to eat. Before school was out for the coronavirus, we had started talking about animals. Does that seem like food that those animals would have liked to have eaten? For extra fun, with mom and dad's permission, you can go to Pebble Goat and you can research about fish and turtles and whales to find out what kind of food they do eat. Life for the townspeople was delicious until the weather took a turn for the worse. Here's the newspaper. It says the Chew and Swallow Digest Spaghetti Ties Up Town. Whoa, Nelly. One day, there was nothing but gorgonzola cheese all day long. If you've never had that kind of cheese before, it is really stinky. The next day, there was only broccoli all overcooked. So it's soggy broccoli. And the next day, there was Brussels sprouts and peanut butter with mayonnaise. Ugh. Another day, there was pea soup fog. No one could see where they were going, and they could barely find the rest of the meal that got stuck in the fog. Brussels sprouts by, the, by themselves might be kind of yummy. I've tried them, and I didn't like them, but I really don't think I would like them with mayonnaise and peanut butter. Oh, maybe with some cheese, but not peanut butter. The food was getting larger and larger. One Tuesday, there was a hurricane of bread and rolls all day long and into the night. There were soft rolls and hard rolls. I hope there were Texas Roadhouse rolls. Um, there was white bread and rye and whole wheat toast. No one had ever seen such big slices of bread or such large rolls before. It was a terrible day. Everyone had to stay indoors. The mess took the sanitation workers four days to clean up, and the sea was full of floating rolls. I forgot. Sanitation workers are um, kind of like the people that collect our garbage and recycling. That's what those guys do. Very important community helpers. To help out, people piled up as much bread as they could in their backyards. It stayed there and got very hard and very stale. That's a bummer. There was a storm of pancakes one morning and a downpour of maple syrup that nearly flooded the town. A huge pancake covered the school. No one could get it off, so they had to close the school. Could you imagine if a giant pancake fell on Aspen Creek and covered up our whole school and playground? That might be a little bit more fun than being closed because people are getting sick. But that would be crazy. It would be difficult to clean up. Lunch one day brought 15-inch drifts of cream cheese and jelly sandwiches. Everyone ate themselves sick, and the day ended with a stomach ache. Poor town. There was an awful salt and pepper wind, followed by an even worse tomato tornado. People were sneezing themselves silly. The town was a mess. There were seeds and tomato pulp everywhere. It does look like a mess. The sanitation department gave up. The job was too big. Everyone feared for their lives. They couldn't go outside most of the time. Many houses had been hit by giant meatballs. That reminds me of that Go Noodle song with the patterns when they sing banana, banana, meatball. You should go check that out when you're done with the story. Um, stores were boarded up and there was no more school for the children, so they decided to leave the town of Chew and Swallow. They had to. Look at those beautiful chocolate sprinkled donuts right there. I think I would like to visit this town. The people made rafts out of the giant pieces of stale bread, glued together with peanut butter, and set sail for a new land. That would be an interesting form of transportation. 
After sailing for a week, they reached a small, friendly town. They built houses for themselves out of their rafts. So they had sandwich houses. The children began school again, and the adults found jobs. The biggest change they had to make was getting used to buying their food at the supermarket. Nothing came down from the sky except rain and snow. The clouds above their heads were not made of fried eggs. No one ever got hit by a hamburger again, and nobody ever dared to go back to Chew and Swallow to find out what had happened to it. They were too afraid. Harry and I were awake until the very end of Grandpa's story. I remember his goodnight kiss. What a sweet grandpa. The next morning we woke up to see snow falling outside our window. We ran downstairs for breakfast and ate it a little faster than usual so we could go sledding with grandpa. It's funny, but even as we were sliding down the hill, we thought we saw a giant pat of butter at the top and we could almost smell mashed potatoes. the end. So I already talked about some fun things you can do. Um, now that we've read this story, you could use Publigo with mom's and dad's permission um, to research about animals and the kind of food that they eat. You can do some research on Publigo to learn about healthy food for your body. Um, and then this is a book that if we were still at school, I would have started teaching you about different kinds of weather, and I would have used this book to do a weather project. But since we're stuck at home, you can do that project by yourself. Um, so you can go to PebbleGo, and there are stories about all the different kinds of weather. There's videos, there's activities, um, and some worksheets you can print off if you want to. Um, so you can look into the weather stuff. And then another fun idea would be to write about what food you would want to fall from the sky. And if you choose to do some writing and some drawing about um, the kind of food weather you'd like to have, have mom and dad email it to me so that I can look at it. I love you. See you later.